coming up next on Business Minds Coffee Chat. That is the single greatest thing that rowing would teach me. It was no good looking at anybody else's blade or whether it's late or early. It was about how good of a teammate can I be? And the more I focused on serving the person right in front of me and right behind me, the better the boat would move. And the more I showed how much I cared about each of them, even when their timing wasn't online, that that became the basis of my leadership training to date. The fact that you're listening to this podcast tells me that you're someone who values their time and is interested in improvement and growth. I've learned over the years that those who want to get better, who want to sharpen their skills, hire coaches. I started my coaching business because I saw firsthand how having the right coach transformed a family member's business and life. This had a profound impact on me, and it's my mission to help others have a similar positive experience. If you've ever thought about hiring a business coach, check this out. Working with me as your coach, you'll gain more clarity on your goals and priorities, be held accountable, learn and apply the tools to maximize your potential, build a rock-solid foundation for your business, and achieve the results and success you deserve. Warren Buffett said, The best investment you can make is in yourself. If you're ready to commit to your personal and professional development, let nothing hold you back. To apply to my coaching program and to schedule a call with me to learn more, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com and click the Book Now button at the top. I look forward to hearing from you. And now, enjoy the latest episode. Hi, this is Alden Mills, author of Be Unstoppable and Unstoppable Teams, and you're tuning in to Business Minds Coffee Chat with Jay Scher. This is Business Minds Coffee Chat, where those interested in personal and professional growth come to listen to and learn from extraordinary business leaders, thought leaders, best-selling authors, renowned psychologists, neuroscientists, and others who are changing the world through the work they do. I'm your host, Jay Shear. Welcome to the conversation. Les Brown said, Life takes on meaning when you become motivated, set goals, and charge after them in an unstoppable manner. Well, on today's episode, we talk about what it takes to be unstoppable, why overcoming adversity can be your greatest asset, changing the limiting beliefs that hold us back, cultivating an unstoppable mindset, the power of goals and taking action, and more. My guest is a husband and father, a former Navy SEAL and Division I athlete. He's a two-time best-selling author, the former Inc. 500 CEO of Perfect Fitness, and founder of multiple businesses. He's been awarded over 40 patents worldwide, and Entrepreneur Magazine ranked him the number one top virtual speaker. You're going to find out why here shortly. Please welcome the man who's living proof that success is available to everyone and whose mission is to help 100 million people be unstoppable, Alden Mills. Alden, it is so great to see you. Thank you for being here today. Jay, it is a real treat. I have to tell you and to tell the audience right out of the gate, the one thing you missed out of the entire intro is I have failed way more than I've succeeded. Mm. So when everybody hears all those accolades, let's not forget about all the failures that I've had along the way. I can pick a failure out in every aspect of my life. So I want to make sure everybody out there knows that uh, these successes just didn't happen overnight. You know, I am so glad that you mentioned that, and thank you for bringing that up as part of the conversation. We do talk about failure and overcoming failure, the lessons that we learn through failing as being so important, right? So many incredible life lessons that that come out of that. So since you brought that up, 
why don't you share with our audience one of the failures that you've experienced? And why don't we go back in time a bit, if you can wind the clock back and speak to one example, what you learned from that, that from that particular failure and how it either changed your perspective or changed who you are as a person? I would start... That's a good, that's a good question to, that's a meaty question to just jump right in there. Cause there's so many of these failures, you know, where I'll start with a failure. I'll start with a failure of I'm halfway through seal training. I am on a three mile swim. I'm the class leader and my lungs are filling up with blood. And I got to raise my hand and get pulled out of the water. And typically when you raise your hand in the swim, that means you're quitting. In this case, I need medical attention. They pull me out. They send me right to emergency. They do a bunch of blood tests and they discover an antigen in my blood. Now that antigen was also discovered because they raided my room and found my asthma medication. And that antigen was medicine I had been taking to cheat to get through SEAL training. And they said, we don't allow asthmatics in here. You're out. Here's a medical shit. You shouldn't have made it this far anyhow. You can be proud of that. It's time to move on. And I had an option right then and there. That was a great time for me. Like, you know, it wasn't going that well for me. And I could just say, hey, I made it through hell week. But I didn't. And I said, you know what? I'm not an asthmatic. He goes, yeah, but you have the medicine. I'm like, I was taking it just to help me with airflow. And it was just a performance thing. I don't need the medicine. They pull me out of that class. They roll me back five and a half weeks. They make me take a whole series of tests. I get through these tests. And for the first time in my adult life, I had to jettison a crutch that I had used for 10 years. I was diagnosed with asthma at the age of 12, had been told, you need to lead a less active lifestyle. You should learn the game of chess. And I didn't really believe it, but I didn't not believe it because I kept taking that medicine. And I had been kind of cheating my way through the Naval Academy in the SEAL team. And I decided that I'm going to drop this medicine. I'm not going to take it anymore. And this may end up sounding a little spiritual to people, but when I use the word faith, I am really referring to the first definition of the word faith in the dictionary. The first definition of faith is having 100% confidence in someone or something other than yourself. I had never really had faith in anything before until that moment. And it was that moment that I decided to start practicing some faith that if this was meant to be, it was going to work. And it became such an intense element of letting go and creating trust that I discovered that that's something I ended up using throughout my entire adult life on everything that I have since gone after where I had no idea what the outcome would be. So what was the outcome to this particular instance? Well, the good news was I got back in the class. I had my own attitude adjustment that I had to learn because repeating one day in SEAL training is miserable. Repeating five and a half weeks was really hard. And you learn a lot about yourself when you have to go back through those elements. That became a successful adventure for me. And I ended up graduating in class 182 and then going on to lead three very successful platoons in SEAL team. But that was a very pivotal moment. I had failed. I had failed on multiple levels, but I had learned the value of what the faith could do for me when you let go and commit. 
and give all you've got and then decide, okay, we're going to let the rest of it sort its way out. Amazing. So let's go back again for a few moments. I would love it if you would share with our audience the, the backstory a bit. How did you ultimately become a Navy SEAL? Was this something that you what was a life ambition for you as a very young man talk talk us through that so we can better understand who, a bit more about who you were early on and then we'll pull the timeline forward the simplest way to bring that back so we got to go back to 12 again um i'm a kid growing up in central massachusetts on a small farm and i love the animals i love going out and hunting snakes and turtles I was terrible at all ball sports, just terrible. And the thing that um, I loved was the water. And I loved anything on the water, on the water, in the water, under the water. And I, but I had been sick a lot, so sick that my mother would have me read stories about Teddy Roosevelt because Teddy Roosevelt got diagnosed with asthma at 12. And she said, you know, here's a great man that had all kinds of maladies and he overcame them and you can do that too. And this one time I was so sick that I ended up having a spinal tap. I had been bedridden for over 30 days. And that's when I got sent to the big city of Wista, Massachusetts. Okay. If anybody knows Wista, it's not that big of a city, but there was a long doctor there, a pulmonologist, and he looked like an older Danny DeVito, bald scalp, white wispy hair, big thick Coke bottle glasses that made his eyes look larger than they actually were. But he constantly looked like he was smelling sour milk, right? His face was kind of squished up and he had a New Englandy accent. And when I walked into his office, he his office looked more like a laboratory and it had all these different tubes and machines to blow and inhale and exhale in and after a while of doing, trying to get a ping pong ball to stay between these lines, he held up his hand and he said, I, I see what the problem is here, Mrs. Mills. Uh, come over here. I want to show you these chats. And he had a chart. And he said, you, you, you see this line right here? This is an average 12-year-old's lung size. Your son's lungs are down here. He was, he was born with smaller than average size lungs. And then he flips the chart and says, and you see this line right here? This is an airway. And his airway is really restricted. It's way down here. You know why? Because he's got asthma. And he's a little less active lifestyle. I suggest the game of chess. You know, at that point, mom saw my body posture, right? Chin dropped down to my chest. Shoulders rolled forward. And she tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, you go wait in the lobby. I'll talk to the good doctor from here. I go out in the lobby and I'm having a total pity party for myself, right? Big crocodile tears. I remember looking at this brown linoleum floor and building up puddles on the floor. After a while, she comes out in her offensive mom position. You know, that's hands on the hips, looking at you. Nudges one of my feet with her foot. What's wrong with you? I'm like, mom, chess? How am I going to learn chess? I'm terrible at checkers. She looked at me. She said, now you listen to me. And she had these long French cuticle nails. And I swear she would file them for moments like this and like little velociraptor claws. And she boom, dug them into my forearm. And she said, now listen, I'll get you that medicine, but you have to decide what you can or can't do. Don't you let anyone else decide for you. Do you understand that? It's up to you. I'm like, okay, okay. Now say it back to me. You know, I, I said it back to her. Of course, I just wanted her to release that grip. And of course, I didn't get it that day or that week. But then I scored on my own team in basketball at the YMCA, which was my gym growing up in our little town. And she'd be like, well, at least you scored. Now go try another sport. And I scored against my own team in hockey, soccer lacrosse 
four different sports. I was terrible at ball sports. I was like tall, gangly kid. But then I found this sport of rowing in high school. And I was like, that's my sport. I can sit on my butt and go backwards in a boat on water. And it's a simple stroke. I'm in. And notice, the only thing I wanted to do is be good at something athletically. I wasn't a kid that had a bunch of Navy SEAL pictures on my walls or anything like that. I didn't have any cami. It was just wanting to be good at something. And I found my something athletically to be good at in the sport of rowing. And rowing is a wonderful sport because it's just about having eight oars. In this case, I rowed in a boat with eight people. There are also four and two man boats and one man, but I was in eights. And everybody's got to get those blades in at exactly the same time. There's no MVP. There's no high point score. It's one boat, eight people. How fast can you make that boat go? I love that. And that took me to the Naval Academy. And while at the Naval Academy and rowing very competitively there, I got introduced to SEAL, SEAL team. And that was when I started to make that transition. So a long-winded answer to your question. I, I appreciate that. The, you know, as you were talking about rowing and eight people in a boat, oars in the water, all moving in the same direction, very fluid. What did you learn about leadership and teamwork at that point? How selfless it has to be. That, that is the single greatest thing that rowing would teach me. It was no good looking at anybody else's blade or whether it's late or early. It was about how good of a teammate can I be? And the more I focused on serving the person right in front of me and right behind me, the better the boat would move. And the more I showed how much I cared about each of them, even when they weren't, even when their timing wasn't online, that that became the basis of my leadership training to date. Beautiful. And that same sense of selflessness and serving the person in front and in back of you, you carried that forward and continued to see many more examples of that in the SEAL teams? Yeah, SEAL team was a perfect extension of rowing. I mean, go through SEAL training itself and, well, you've got inflatable boats, eight people in a boat, four on each side, you get to paddle forward instead of backwards. Yeah, that's it's, it's a little metaphorical there because you're not doing that all the time, but SEAL team is the same thing. There may be someone that has a better shot than somebody else, but not everyone's shooting. Everyone needs to know how to interoperate together, and they need to know how to interoperate selflessly to whatever the team needs. You know, once you get to a point in a real team environment, rowing, championship teams in different varieties, they become shared consciousness. Right, The team itself becomes its own organizational being. And when everybody has that shared consciousness, that selflessness that moves everyone together, it becomes wildly malleable and adaptable to every situation that you handle. And SEAL Team was like that. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to describe this to people and I'm also here to tell people that you can do this in your own organization but imagine for a moment you have a team and everybody on that team is willing to die for you do you know how powerfully unstoppable you feel when you're going into any situation that any one of them is willing to take the bullet or jump on the grenade or ensure that the healthiness of the 
team is taken care of. Now, the good news is the large majority of all listeners out here, I hope, don't have to be called to duty for that, right? The, the having each other's back for all of us entrepreneurs out there is about stepping in at just the right moment in the sales call or being able to provide the right solution at the right moment for the customer or internally for someone who's struggling with a problem and has gotten so down in the weeds they've forgotten the bigger picture and someone without judgment can come in and be like, hey, Annie, think about this or Fred, how about trying this? Those are the elements that you can extrapolate from the same team dynamics that you get from a highly focused team environment. That's so, selflessness. And, you know, as you're describing this and bringing this to the, the business environment, I think about, well, the word culture comes up. Mm -hmm. And when we have a culture of, strong leadership when we have a culture of being able to serve others with excellence when we have a culture of doing good and continuing to to learn and to to push ourselves to to grow and to not to continue to raise our standards looking out for one another mm -hmm. helping to coach up others looking mm -hmm. at bringing in the next level of leadership and developing new leaders, you know, all of those things, I, you know, I hear that in the words that you're using. And today, the work that you do when you're working with clients, when you're out speaking, when you're transforming lives, these are the types of topics and the types of trainings that you provide to organizations becoming unstoppable. It is. And, and the way I break this down is first to remind everybody out there, you are built to be unstoppable. You have it. It's in you. I promise you, each and every person listening to this, you have it. The key leadership decision you have to make is choosing to be unstoppable for this moment. Okay, now the next moment. And the way I break this down is I look at leadership in three levels of leadership. And I'd like people to think about this as a reflection pond, this beautiful, still, dead calm pond, crystal clear water, and you've taken a pebble and you've dropped it right into the middle of the pond. And you can very clearly see these three concentric larger circles develop. They ripple out from that pebble you dropped in there. That pebble was the action you took. That's what that represents. The first ring represents your first level of leadership. That's leading you and taking care of all the things that you can control, which I break down into three. If you distill it all, it really comes down to thoughts, focus, and beliefs. The second larger ring from that pebble of action that you dropped in there is the second level of leadership, which is leading the team. Team leadership is nothing more than a reflection of its leader. When I get parachuted in to deal with the United Steelworkers Union for a Fortune 50 massive tech company in the Bay Area or a multi-billion dollar law firm, you always go to the leader of whatever the division is you're working at because the team is nothing more than that reflection of that leader. Now, the third ring that reflects out there is the largest ring. And the largest ring is what I call the third level of leadership. And that is culture. And culture is nothing more than consistent, repeatable actions that are taken from the teams within that organization. So when you look at the culture of an organization, 
you look at the transitive properties, it really comes back down to the leaders, right? Culture is nothing more than a reflection of the team. Team is nothing more than a reflection of this leader. So the work begins and ends with each of the individuals that are in the influencing positions. That's how I do the work. You know, I, I love that that visual of the the pond and the pebble being dropped in and the ripples. So just to recap, to make sure that I understand it as well, the the pebble that we drop in, that's the action that's taken. So the first Leadership ripple, action. if you will, that's leading ourselves. Those right. are that's controlling the things that we can control, our thoughts, our beliefs, our own focus. The second would be leading the team itself, leading teams. And then the third concentric circle would be culture itself. Correct. Amazing. Now I have frameworks, obviously, for each of those. And, and you know, going through this process is a as a coach, you have to meet the people where they're at. I find it, I don't find it nearly as helpful if you just show them and say, hey, I got a 12 step process. I'm just going to put you in the process because everybody's different. Everybody's a different kind of leader. And I actually want to bring a point up about that, Jay, to remind everybody everyone is a leader. There isn't like some 23 and me test that genetically comes back saying, oh, congratulations, Jay, you got the leadership gene, but Alden didn't. No, it's because that doesn't exist. Because every single person has to have led themselves to listen to this podcast, has to led themselves to take an action, to get out of bed, to go do certain things. Now, the same basis of doing those things, whatever those basic leadership actions of getting yourself dressed and getting yourself ready to go to work and deciding what you're going to do for work are exactly the same basic elements that you can use to effectively become your best version of your leader, activating your own leadership potential. I don't like putting people in little personality buckets. It's like colors of the rainbow. I mean, what do they say about colors? And something like 65,000 different shades of different colors of things. Like We're all different, but we all can be leaders. You're here. Couldn't agree with you more on that point. And we don't need a title to be a leader. We lead in our oh. families. We lead in our businesses. We lead in our personal lives, the way that we show up every day, the actions that we take. I, I want to spend a moment on leading you as we're talking about personal leadership. And you talked about, or at least you mentioned thoughts and focus and beliefs. So for someone who may have, may be experiencing some limiting beliefs that are holding them back, a story they've been telling themselves, mm -hmm. and they just can't figure out how to move past that. What would be some advice that you would share with someone on how to identify those beliefs and then how to flip the script on those to turn that into something that empowers us to be able to grow and take the right actions? Well, you use the operative first word. I have built acronyms and I build acronyms because a lot of my work is also done on a big stage. And so I like things that I can remember and not have to refer back to a slide or read off of something. And I also want it to be in alignment with what the out desired outcome is. In this case, what we're going to talk about is the belief loop. And the belief loop I call I can. There are four steps to converting a belief, limiting one, into an empowering one. Now, before we get into that, and do we want to go through those steps? Would you like? I, I would. I would love to. I, th I think that would be very meaningful to our audience. So the very first rule on beliefs is that I want everyone to understand 
We have all kinds of beliefs all the time. We hear them. We see them. We accept them. They are neither limiting or empowering at that moment until we decide to attach to them and allow an action to be driven by them. A belief is nothing more than something we hold to be true. And you must also appreciate that a belief is something we can change. It is within our control. If you do not accept that fundamental law of humanity, then the rest of this isn't going to make any sense to you. So I need you to believe that you can change your beliefs. This is a leadership 101, very important rule. Don't take Alden Mills' advice or Jay's. Go look it up on the internet. Read about it. See that every neuroscientist out there, psychological, psychiatrist, and everybody else will tell you beliefs are something you can change. So how do you do it? Well, the first thing is I... Right? The idea is that I want to have beliefs that tell me I can do something. Beliefs typically show up when we meet the friction of our lives. And when I mean the friction, it's the struggle. It's the obstacle. It's the problem. The friction is actually the thing we must seek. We need the friction. The friction gives us forward progress. If a car is sitting there on ice and there is no friction the wheels are just spinning don't go through life like a car with its wheels on ice and sit and spin seek the friction embrace it get excited that yes i've got this i've got this obstacle i'm going to turn into an opportunity i got this problem we're going to find possibilities out of it there is advantage to adversity I want you to embrace the fact that you're facing the friction. And when you face that friction, something is going to come up that says, Alden, what are you doing? You have asthma. There is no way you're going to make it through SEAL training. No way. Forget about it. Can't be done. You don't, don't even try out. Don't even go through the pain and the embarrassment of doing poorly on the physical fitness test. That was a belief that went through my head many times until I had this other voice that was like, hey, you're a Division I national championship on, a, on your team. You, you got invited to the Olympic camp. You can do that. Go try it. You don't have asthma. Move on. Keep going. But the key is you have to identify the narrative, which is what you brought up right in the beginning. That's the I of I can. You got to identify it. If you don't, if you can't figure out what it is, I use this thing that I really took off of uh, Toyota back in the 1970s it's called Toyota's Five Whys. And the Five Whys goes through a system of basically you can get to the root cause by asking why, 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 why. And typically between three and five whys, you'll actually get to the root cause. Kids are great at that. Why. What's that? I said kids are great at that. Yes, they are. Uh, you, If you do the whys enough on why you think you can't do something, you'll eventually boil it down to its fear. Your blocking force is fear in one of its many faces, right? A face of fear could be doubt, embarrassment. Uh, I failed once before. Uh, fear has many faces to it. But trust me, the reason you can't do something typically, it's based on fear. Once you've identified that, now you got to challenge it. That's the C of can. And the challenge that I would offer you are two different things. Number one, play the opposite game. Go out there and say, now imagine you can do this. What's your life look like? What happens? 
Where do you go? Propel yourself out into the future of the opposite game. Look at the absolute positive to the negative of what you're telling yourself you can't do. By the way, in nature, nature goes to homeostasis. There is always a balance. There is always a positive to a negative, no matter what it is. It just comes in a different wrapper. You, while you're doing that challenge, I want you to seek out three different people from three different walks of your life. Maybe it's somebody that's not in your chain of command at work. Maybe it's someone that's in your church. Maybe it's someone that you played sports with or you go out on a bowling league with or whatever you like to do for a hobby. And ask them about what they think about this belief that's holding you back. You need three because you're trying to triangulate. And this is... Uh, when you do this with uh, GPS, that's why you need a minimum of three GPSs. This is the little triangle, by the way, I'm creating with my hands, right? You got three different points, make a triangle, and that can lock you into position. You get more points, your triangle gets smaller and get even more exact. But the key is you want people outside your line of work from different walks of your life. Be careful if you decide to use family. Some family members lie to you. They only do it because they love you. So you're after those that aren't going to really bullshit you. The next one is then assessing. You got to take the action and the challenge. And you say, okay, well, if this happens, what would that be? Would that be acceptable to me? It would. I'm going to try. You'll probably fail at first because most people aren't good at things the first time they do it. And you use the assessing to track your progress of how you're making the improvement. That's part Three is then you assess the progress of the actions that you take. You decide what works, what doesn't work, and you keep trying. The final piece is called neutralize. That's the N of I can. And the key piece of neutralizing is starting and ending the day in different times throughout the day of flipping the narrative in your head to a new narrative. You got to coach your head to a new narrative. And in this case, the narrative must be in the present tense. I am a Navy SEAL. Not I can't be a Navy SEAL. I am. I already am the Navy SEAL. And if you really want to geek out about it, now I, I just picked this one up. I mean, it's just a little rubber wristlet. This one is one that I had printed. Leadership that's all in all the time, right? But I, I did this for some company, but... You put this on one wrist. Every time you say it, you put it on the other wrist. Say it the next time, you move it back and forth. Take your watch. Take a ring. I don't care, right? I'm using this as a very simple example. Make it a rubber band. But you have to start being intentional. As intentional as you were about the identify, you have to be intentional about creating the new narrative. And the more you start to practice that with backing it up with your actions, then you'll find you can and you will do what you're after. Wow. This is so good and so powerful. All of you that are watching and listening right now, I hope you're taking notes. I definitely am. And more importantly, that you are going to take those notes and then apply what you're learning here today. And here's the truth. And we're always looking for the truth. We all have limiting beliefs. There are things that we tell ourselves about ourselves that today disempower us and hold us back from accomplishing the things that the great things that we have the ability within ourselves to accomplish. So following these four steps, I can, I love the Number one, the the four, the simplicity of it, right? Not simple, but the simplicity of the four steps themselves. But you hit on such an important point, and it's the action step. It's taking the action. We can read about this. I can listen to you telling me about this. But until I do something with it, until I attach the action to it, absolutely nothing changes so so powerful and i want to go back 
because this is how we kind of started this conversation. The taking the action and the first step is terrifying. It's 100% terrifying. And sometimes it can be so overwhelming to you that you want to give up before you even start. And that's when you've got to have faith. You can have faith in you, in me. Like I heard it with Alden and Jay talking together and they just sound so committed. And I believed in them so much. I have faith in what they're saying. I'm going to try. I'm just going to take the action. It's just one action. That's what we're asking you to do. To me, that's why I came on this show. I love what you do. I think you're speaking from the heart. And I think people will believe you and trust you enough to have faith in you to try it and the people you bring on there. And that, at the end of the day, is what a leader is about, is building enough faith in other people that people will do something, even if they're not sure they can do it, because leadership is about pushing people beyond what they originally thought was possible. And to do that means you have to let go of limiting beliefs. Like I let go of the limiting belief that I had asthma and I needed the medication. I let go of it. You can find faith in all kinds of different places. You know, the second definition is religious doctrine. Find it there. I believe in God. You can believe in any kind of God you want. That's the point of this is to be able to let go of the limiting things like cutting through an old, tired, rusted anchor chain that's holding your boat back from leaving your harbor of mediocrity to set sail for that great, new, empowering harbor that you seek. This is so incredibly important. I'm actually I'm giving a keynote tomorrow night that's going to be central to this particular topic in general. Great. And I hope this helps you. It, it absolutely does. And I, and I had a conversation with a business leader earlier today, and we talked about the beliefs that we have. We talk about those things that, that block us, that hold us back. And it's so relevant. And this is a business leader who's very successful in their role and who's mm -hmm. been not only in the entrepreneurial space, but in the nonprofit space and has been in a a high level leadership role for years. And even that individual still deals with these self limiting beliefs that hold them back from maximizing their potential. Hence, the reason that I mentioned that we all deal with it. Every conversation that I have, this topic tends to come up. And I, I look back over my life, over my career to this point, and there have been so many times that I told myself a story that wasn't really true, but it's something that I believed about myself. And the crazy thing about that, and I'm sure that you have seen this to be the case as well, we'll find the evidence to support that negative belief oh, if we're looking for it. Right. So if I say, Jay, you're not the kind of person who can do that, that can do X, Y, Z, I will spend time and I will find some evidence of me not 100%. being able to do that thing. And then I draw a conclusion that, see, there you go. And what a shame. What a shame. But you're providing us the tool that can help us move past that, which can completely transform the person that we are and what we're capable of doing. So I'm grateful for you sharing that with us. I uh, want to, can I just add one other thing about that tool of identify? Please. A very important theme for everybody. There are two basic sets of fears, the fear of staying put and the fear of moving forward until the fear of staying put is greater than the fear of moving forward, you're going to find reasons to stay put. So when you get into the challenge phase, you have to find reasons to create the fear of staying put to be greater than the fear of setting sail to your new destination. Wow. So true. So very true. 
it, again, it's it's an interesting psychological aspect that we all experience and that we all deal with. So I wanted to ask you about identity. So when you left the SEAL teams, what what was that experience like for you from a self-identity standpoint? Was that a difficult transition? Did you attach your identity and your self-worth to being a SEAL? Or was there more to who you were at that point when you left? Never been asked that before. I would say my first identity that I really attached to because I had done it for eight years was rowing. And then rowing took me to SEAL team. And then I became this Navy SEAL. And for me, I can trace pretty much everything back in seven year chapters of my life. And I had made the decision and it was the hardest decision at that time of my young adult life. I'm 30. Now, mind you, I'd been in the military since I was 18, going to the Naval Academy and then SEAL team to say, you know, it's time for me to want to start a family. And I want to learn the language of business. And I'd like to learn how to build some products that could help a large number of people. And I really enjoyed serving in SEAL team. So I bring up kind of two points. When I showed up to business school, I felt wildly out of place. I watched people crying because they didn't get an A on a test. And I'm trying to console them by saying, hey, no one's shooting at you. Like, what are you, what are you worried about? Like, your parachutes, you don't have to worry about your parachute not opening or running out of air or at 100 feet underwater. Like, so what if you got that different grade on a test? And, and, and then the other thing that was a real challenge to me was I had traded purpose for a paycheck. At least that's what it felt like in business school. You know, in the military, your paychecks are published. Everybody knows what everybody makes. It's not even, there's no guessing game, right? It's every two two weeks comes out in the Navy Times, Army Times, Air Force Times, Marine Corps Times. They show you what the paycheck is or whatever your, uh, your group is or your, you know, your rank. So there are some things that my identity was really – I didn't really think of myself like, hey, I'm Billy Badass Navy SEAL. Get out of my way. Don't mess with me. My identity was more associated with I'm a team player and I know how to lead. And I know how to do it in the military. I want to learn how to do it as a civilian. There were times where I used the elements of Navy SEALs, the identity, not to thump my chest, but to give an experience share to help people deal with an obstacle that they felt was insurmountable. And I really have the good fortune of this first commanding officer that used to drive this point home. He was like a Greek philosopher. And he would remind me constantly. And I was one of the bigger guys in my SEAL platoon at the time. I was you know, six foot three, 260 pounds. And he'd be like, Millsy, only ever be as tough as the situation dictates. And a large majority of the situations don't require you to be tough. It can be tough to be tender. Learn that. And so... Even to this day, you know, when people hear like, oh, he's a Navy SEAL. I mean, I've been a CEO three times as long as I've been a Navy SEAL now. Uh, you still get labeled as a Navy SEAL. You know, I was 30 and then I did the reserve. So I got out at, I guess, 34. I'm 54 now. So 20 years of being a CEO. So I, I guess that's a long-winded way to, to say about my identity was – was always about trying to lead. 
which meant I had to learn how to lead myself more. Because <laughs> leading in a civilian world is much harder than leading in the SEAL world. Much harder. Why? First of all, you have the uniform code of military justice in the Navy SEALs. I'm the officer and the platoon commander. I give an order. That's the law. You disobey my order, I can send you to captain's mast. I can get your pay docked. You can't do that in the civilian world, right? You, you, don't, you don't have that kind of horsepower. Even as a CEO, I mean, I could just fire you, but I'd run out of people real fast, right? And a lot of times in wartime, it's about go left right now. That's what I'm telling you to do. Don't. There's no discussion about this. It's the wrong decision. Well, we'll figure it out real quick. In the civilian world, you really have to win the hearts and minds of people to get them to join your cause. In the military, you got to set the example, and eventually, you got to win their hearts and minds too. But it's not nearly as the compromising and contextual conversation that you have in the civilian world. But the more you can treat civilians like volunteers, the better chances you have for connecting with their heart and winning them to your cause, which then becomes their cause. And that's the key. Beautiful. Share with us from your experience and what you have learned since entering the world of business and you've founded a number of businesses from your experience what makes the best leader uh that's really simple to me and that is the best leaders are the ones that care the most you know one of my all-time favorite quotations said by good old president teddy roosevelt over 100 years ago and I think he said it something like this. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. He's right. Right? If you go in all hard charging, barking orders, do this, do that, half-witted, people are going to look at you and be like, you have no idea what you're talking about. And you don't care the slightest in me or anybody else. You just care about the outcome that's going to make you look good. But if people really feel cared for, then a switch flips. And it takes a while for the switch to flip. But the switch will flip from going selfish to selfless. And the more you care over time, the more they will dare. And what I mean by that is when they know their backs are protected, metaphorically speaking, that somebody has my back, by the way, it can also mean literally if you're in combat, close quarter combat in particular, then their front side focus is forward. And they're thinking about ways to solve whatever the problem is facing them. And they're not worried about their own backs because they know someone's got that back protected for them. Which brings me back to the very beginning of our conversation and getting people to imagine what it's like with a team where everybody has each other's backs. It sounds trite, but caring leads to daring. That is so good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. So as we are wrapping up our conversation, I've got a couple questions for you. We have all of your social links which we'll put in the show notes, links to be able to purchase your books as well. I would love it if you would share with us what one to two big questions are that you're asking yourself today. Well, probably the single biggest question is, how can I help 100 million people? Now, this 100 million people, you mentioned it in the beginning of the show, the reason I use 100 million, I'm extrapolating through the rest of my life. By the time I die, there'll be 10 billion people on this earth. 
Take 1% of that, it's 100 million people. I'm just after the 1%. We can help 1% achieve a goal to flip the switch and go from a limiting to an empowering belief. That 1% will infect the rest of humanity. And I am certain those one percenters are listening on this show. And I created with a dear buddy of mine, this software platform called GoalBud that will help people do the very basic things that are required to make a goal occur. They make that goal, they build a goal team, and they create commitments and report to each other on the commitments of the actions they take. And that process is the process in which we can scale. And by the way, it's a free app, right? It's out there, just people download it. I want you to, and the whole point is that you go and build a team. You're not doing it by yourself. And I don't care if you pick your goal is to lose 20 pounds or make $20 million. But once you start to appreciate how much actual personal power you have, after you do a few ego-based goals, you're going to get bored of them. And you're going to go, you know, how can I help somebody else do something? And that's where the magic happens, right? That's where we start infecting each other. In much the same way, I am certain you decided throughout your career, I've done this, I've done this. You know what? I'm going to create this podcast. And I'm going to go help other people. Because that's where the real joy lives, right, Jay? Absolutely. So that's the big question every single day that I think of, along with how can I help my four boys, right? At the end of the day, the greatest leadership opportunities they are being a parent or a foster parent, right? Raising the next generation. So those are my two levels of questions. That is outstanding. And I can share with you that today, the impact that you've made through sharing your insights, through sharing all that you have on this particular episode has moved you closer to impacting and changing the lives of 100 million people. So it's amazing. Here's my final question to you, and it's really an ask I would love it if you would give our audience a challenge. What would you challenge them to do? I would challenge them to sit down and write down where they want to be in 10 years. And I want them to be as detailed as possible. And if they can't think of where they want to be in 10 years, then I would challenge them to come up with two goals that are personal and two girls that are professional. And then after they've gone through that, they write down one of those goals and they put it up and they look at it. And I want you to go achieve that goal in less than three years. Because what you're going to find is that when you ask people to do a long-term goal, they typically are still too short-sighted. You have them do a 10-year goal. It's really a three-year goal. Three-year goal is a one-year goal. One-year goal is like 90 days because they've forgotten how powerful they really are. Wonderful. You heard it, everyone, straight from Alden's mouth. How about you take him up on that challenge? And I would love to hear from you. Why don't you share what 10 years out looks like for you or what those two specific goals are. And again, get detailed on this. So Alden, I want to thank you so very much for joining us today on Business Minds Coffee Chat. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I appreciate you bringing it, sharing of your wisdom, sharing of your insights, of your knowledge, of your stories and being your true authentic self. I truly have enjoyed this. And I know, as we talked about before the cameras were rolling during this conversation, you have made an impact. And I know that you're changing lives today. So I want to thank you so much. I'm grateful for you. Well, Jay, it's mutual. 
keep doing what you're doing, keep inspiring people. And I hope we can meet again. I would love that. Thank you for tuning into Business Minds Coffee Chat. Your support helps us continue to bring you amazing guests. Please share the show with a friend and subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Here's to your personal and professional growth. Thank you.